What's the most painful way to die? Shotgun blast? Speeding bus? Drowning? But for many, burning alive is the most unimaginable fate. In 1994, Chris survived an industrial accident that left him with burns over 69% of his body. Just living defied all odds. In Call Me Chris, Chris Aiken shares his harrowing journey of survival, recovery, and the brutal honesty of facing life after the flames. It's raw, real, and a testament to human resilience. Get your copy of Call Me Chris today at chrisaiken.net or on Amazon. Witness the power of determination. Plenty of places to experience the Seth Williams Show, but if you want all the content, you need to join us on Minds. Get all the live episodes of the show every Monday and Wednesday from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Get the special bonus footage every Wednesday from 5.30 to 6 p.m. Get bonus content from Seth and Chris as it's produced. It's only $4.99 per month, so don't wait. Sign up today. Visit us at www.minds.com slash Seth Williams Show. And if I do say so myself, Seth, yes, we have been killing it on the mines. <laughs> Those oh, yeah. have been fantastic. Those have been great. Yeah, nobody's watching them, but they've been really good. <laughs> um, he's rebooting his computer now as we speak. Okay, all good. Yeah, no, the mines the other day with the... Um, with the uh, Shamu stuff. <laughs> yeah, that was really funny. Uh. <laughs> that whole sec that that's the funniest part is like the first hour and a half feels like an hour and a half. That second half hour, that tell me it doesn't feel like it's gone in like two seconds. We Ooh, look so up and quickly. it's like we look up, it's like, oh, you gotta go do some work. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, mind stuff it, is big. And this ain't a sell. If you don't want it, don't get it. But don't man. get it. But uh, I have fun doing it, so that's fine. It's a lot of fun, and it is way dirtier than this half, if it can possibly be way dirtier than this half. Tom is there. <laughs> he says, I felt like I lost one of my best friends. Never knew him personally. Met all you guys a couple of times at Trez, uh, Vegas shows. Uh -huh. Tom, I'll be contacting you soon also. But uh, thanks for listening today, Tom. I'll be contacting you shortly. Cool. Uh, we do have Miss Herman AC now. All right. 
Let's bring him on. It's our election preview show, if you will. And That's Mr. Right. Jim Renacy, former congressman, businessman, and uh, podcast host. How are you, my friend? Good. How are you all doing? Good. Hey, I don't know if you're aware of this. Today was, and you were good friends with uh, Mike Trevisano. Today I was, was three, absolutely. Today is three years to the day that he passed away. Today. Oh, my goodness. I was not aware of that. Boy, and I miss him years? every time. I think a dry, when I'm driving and I think I, I got 1100 on, I miss, I certainly miss him. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, radio hasn't been the same. I know you do some stuff on 1100 still, so that's good. But uh, yeah, it's uh, three years to the day. Wow. Can't believe it's gone that, uh, that quickly. So. All right. Yeah. So we are going to save the world is what we uh, have to do now. Not just the country, <laughs> but it's time to save the world with this election that's coming up. Do you agree with that? Well, this is definitely an historic election. I mean, there is no doubt about it. We have a president, a, run, a former president running for re-election. It's only happened one other time back in the late 1800s. Um, and, uh, you know, we have an African, uh, African-American female running against him, which is also historic. I mean, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting race. And, uh, uh, wow. It's neck and neck, and as I keep hearing, it's very close as we speak. Probably going to be decided by thirty or forty thousand votes in seven states. Now, Jim, let me let me start right there since you opened that door. Do you really believe the polling? I mean, I saw President Trump over the weekend on the Rogan podcast, and he basic—I mean, he not not basically—he exactly said that the polls are nonsense. I don't know that that's true, but how much stock do you, as somebody that's worked in the game, give the polls? And why should we believe the polls when there's so few people, regular people, that could ever say that they were polled? Well, you're exactly right. And look, I think in the old days, the polls were very important. They were landlines. People were willing to give uh, their, their vote and talk about it. Today, we have so many sources, landlines are gone, you gotta get cell phones, uh, you gotta communicate via text messages. It's just not the same old polls that it used to be, which is why I sometimes wonder, and I can tell you that people that do get polled that I've talked to, they tell me they put in the wrong information just to screw things up, which is kind of shocking as well, because then you gotta wonder whether the polling is accurate or not. Also, I wonder, there are a lot of people that don't want to come out when it comes to Donald Trump. He's probably one of the most polarizing candidates we've ever had in any kind of race around the country. And I think a lot of people are, are intimidated to even say that they're voting for him. People don't want to put bumper stickers out. People don't want to put signs out because they're afraid of the way people are going to treat them. Do you think that's true? I do believe that. And by the way, I think, it's, I think there's a reverse technology compared to 2016. In 2016... Like me, I came out and endorsed former uh, candidate Trump, and you know I was chastised by everybody. So a lot of people didn't want to come out. They didn't want to say they were voting for Trump, but clearly they did. I think we have a little bit of a different situation now in 2020, uh, 2024, and that's that I think there are people that are afraid to say they're not going to vote for Trump. And that's a whole other situation that may bring the polls into a whole different place. I mean, I have talked to solid Republicans who have told me they are not voting for Trump. And I'll say why, and they'll say, well, he's just not a Republican. He's, he, he, he doesn't uh, believe in the conservative principles of the party, and they go through the process, and in the end, it's hard to convince them. You know, I say, well, look at the alternative, and they said, well, I'm not gonna vote for her either. So that's where we have what I call this undecided. They're not really undecided on who they're gonna vote for. They're undecided on whether they're gonna vote. Well, that's one thing that we talked about today with, with Bob. I think Bob's coming on your show tomorrow night. The Buckeye War Room, is that correct, Bob? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it's something like 42 million or something like Christians or something are, are like not voting at all in this election. Doesn't that defeat the purpose? I mean, that that's putting the movement behind. I think it's putting your own self-interest ahead of what we need to actually be accomplishing. Well, but I do think some of them are going to vote. They're just not going to vote for those two candidates. See, that's the other thing that's going to occur. They're going to, they're going to vote for write-ins. I mean, people are pretty adamant. Uh, whether, you, whether you like Paul Ryan or not, and he was never a, my favorite, but he was a friend of mine when I was in Congress. Paul Ryan came out and said, 
you know, I'm going to write in a candidate. And there's the perfect example. He said, neither of those candidates represent the Reagan Republican a candidate that I believe in and I support. So I'm going to write in a Reagan Republican candidate. I don't know who that'll be, but I think some of that's going on as well. Dude, and, and again, it's not our place to tell anybody who to vote for. I think we all understand that. But at the same time, do people, and, and you speak to more people than I do on this specific issue, do those people that are saying that understand the real crossroads that we are at as a nation it's more important than ever look i'm not a trump guy i'm gonna vote for donald trump i will say that up front but i i don't like donald trump i really don't and that all being said i'm looking at my family my groceries my gas bills my mortgage i'm looking at my real world life and i'm picking the one that makes the most sense to my real world life if you're just voting some third party candidate that's not going to win and you know they're not going to win, isn't that just saying my life isn't as important as my cause? Well, I could tell you what they, their answer is. And, and okay. it, look, I, I mean, I'm not going to argue with them when they say it. Here's what they say. Sure. You know, 10 years, 15 years. I had one person say to me, in my heart of all hearts, I can't look at my kids and vote for Donald Trump. The other person said to me, 15 years from now, if Donald Trump takes up, now this is not me speaking, these are, sure, sure. These, are, these are people that are making this decision, but they say 15 years from now, if Donald Trump wins and takes us down the wrong path and everybody complains, I'm at least going to be able to say, that wasn't my person, I didn't believe in him back then. They said, so, so those are the arguments they're using. Now, good, bad, or indifferent, I mean, you just said it, they have the right to vote for anybody they want to vote for. And surprisingly enough, I, I worked for the Board of Elections for a year just so I understood how it worked in Ohio. People still vote Mickey Mouse every once in a while, too. So, I, I just I personally, again, I'm not an only Trumper. I do like a lot of what he says, but I can't in good conscience vote for somebody like Kamala Harris who didn't even go through the process of being elected. I didn't even go through the didn't think one vote to be able to run for president, much less you know, a, a candidate that I would vote for as a communist, for God's sake. I, I, I can't in good conscience vote the other side just because I hate Donald Trump. Well, remember, most of these people are not voting the other side. They're either not voting or they're writing in, which is why turnout's going to be so important. Who turns out the, the most voters that support them will win this race? And especially who turns out the most voters in the seven swing states is what's going to make a difference. We know in Ohio... Trump's going to win. Now, he may not win by that eight-point margin that he's won in the past, but he's going to win. And in the end, um, our state is going to go towards uh, former President Trump. It's the states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. And by the way, those are the key states. If she's able to hold Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, which is going to be very close, uh, I think she becomes the next president. And I know people don't like me saying that, but I'm sorry, if you look at the electoral map, those three states are important. And that's why he's spending so much time, both candidates are spending so much time, in Pennsylvania especially, but also Michigan and Wisconsin. They're both trying to win that, as they used to call it, the blue wall. We, we're taking questions, too, from people that have, who text in. You have a question, we're happy to ask it. Um, what about early voting? Have you seen a big difference this time around in early voting as far as Republicans are concerned? Well, you know what's interesting, and, and I've been tracking early voting nationally by state, even by locations, because I, I do a lot of these podcasts to talk about it. Early voting, Republican early voting is up. But you got to remember that the Republicans have told Republicans now to early vote. So that's somewhat of expected. You know, Democrat early voting is up in Democrat areas. But Democrat early voting, for instance, in Ohio is not up. Republican early voting is up. But Here's the real question that a lot of people have to ask themselves. When you look at who's voting, a super majority of women are voting. Now, the question is, who is the one? Now, we, we, we can say, well, the Republicans. Yeah, but just because they're Republicans doesn't mean they're going to vote for Donald Trump, which is the concern I have. When I look at early voting around the country and you look at all of this early voting, I look to the next tab 
which shows that women are predominantly um, 60%, 57%, 59% of the early voting is the female voter. And let's be honest, I don't think that favors the Republican Party with the platform that Kamala is running on, which is basically abortion, because she doesn't have a whole lot of other plans, but she sure as hell is saying, go out there and get your abortions. Well, and in Ohio, by the way, that's that's one of the reasons why, and I could be wrong, or we can talk after November 5th, but I, I don't think uh, former President Trump gets to 8%, because let's face it, we saw what happened with issue one back in uh, November of last year. You know, there were a majority of Ohio voters that supported issue one, which was the abortion uh, issue. So, you know, if I'm running against him, which is what uh, Kamala Harris is doing, she's going to bring up that abortion issue over and over again in states like Ohio to try and narrow the margin for candidates, especially Republican candidates. So you're exactly right. But again, this comes down to, to lies, though. Jim, I mean, they talk about abortion. Donald Trump has never proposed a national abortion ban. Either is Bernie Moreno. But, you know, Donald Trump gave the, the rights to the states, which is what our country is built on, uh, the republic that we are. That's what it's supposed to be about. And yet they keep running on this, this platform of abortion, abortion, abortion. You can go get an abortion. You just have to go to a state that has it. You, apparently you can come to Ohio and get one if that's what you'd like to do. But they don't want a national abortion ban. And why is this such a, a big deal? Well, because it works. And let's face it, that's the issue. When things work, you use them. When things don't work, especially in politics, I get so many phone calls every day, people saying, well, I think Trump's winning. I think he, look at the majority of Republicans. I always say, wait a minute, he could be winning. But I look at the, I always pull the tabs and look at what's, re what's really happening, who the early voters are. They're females. How many percent of females are going to vote against Donald Trump? Those are the questions. If I'm running his campaign, I'd be looking at and I'd be concerned about. Right. Jim, I, I want to I'm going to put a video here on the screen. This just broke, I don't know, a couple hours ago or maybe last night. I don't know if you've seen this. It, and it, it has to do with um, the early voting and the, the ballot boxes. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but. Apparently, there's already people lighting these boxes on fire with the with the ballots. You know, the the early voting. What happens in this type of a case? I mean, are the I'm assuming they can't obviously count this. I mean, does that does that go into the fraud that we're expecting to be a big issue come November sixth? Well, I did see that. Let's face it. I mean, if the, the ballots that are in there are gone and you know, it's one of the reasons why we shouldn't have those ballot boxes. We should right. not have them. There's a perfect example. You know, now there are people that say we should only vote on election day. We shouldn't vote in advance. Um, I don't know. I, I'm okay voting in advance. In fact, I've already voted. The problem is when you have these ballot boxes, though, those are just, and by the way, now that somebody saw that, what do you think is going to happen? Around yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna say, hey, here's a way to uh, destroy ballots. Well, and yeah. then you also have what the Virginia governor saying that it's okay puts like fifteen hundred illegals back on the voting rolls. I mean, we have a lot of illegal problems in in this country too. Yeah, well, again, all of this stuff is, but that's why the election should be left to the states. You don't want the federal government overseeing it and causing problems. Just like abortion now is left to the states. Elections should be left to the states, and Ohio does a really good job with it. Only problem is Ohio does have ballot boxes, and I worry about those, but Ohio's got a good system. Um, but let's face it, any system is going to have issues. Any system. Sure. I don't care if you just vote on the same day, one day, uh, because think of it from that standpoint. How about the person that can't make it to vote that day? Is it fair that, and how about our, how about our military that are not here? They should have the right to vote, too. So you got to have mail-in voters. you got to have options so that people's vote can be counted. At the same time, you got to protect uh, the integrity of the voting as well. well sure. I'm just waiting for them to break out online voting where all of a sudden anybody can <sighs> vote from wherever you want to because you know that's next. Uh, you know what? I, it's funny you said that because I was thinking that, that someday down the road that probably will be the case because you can have an encrypted vote and but like anything 
every everything we do, there's weaknesses in any system, which is why you got to test. One of the things I like about Ohio, they test the machines before, they test the machines after, they make sure that they counted properly. They have Republicans and Democrats at every location. I mean, I don't know what else you could do. I, I, I really know. don't know what else you could do. I don't know either, but I know that Frank LaRose has been kind of absent in a lot of this stuff. We've asked for him to come on and we've been declined. And I know that we've talked to, I don't know if you know Marcel Sturbich. He's big time into uh, I mean, all this election stuff. And he's talked about numerous cases of people complaining about ballot machines not working and Trump uh, ballots being rejected by machines. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on that we don't have answers for. And I'm concerned about that this year. Well, again, every, uh, you know, I can only tell you what I saw when I worked at the, uh, at the Medina County uh, Board of Elections. I mean, these machines do not have access to computers. It's illegal to have them internet capable. All of this stuff is there. Now, can it happen? Well, I'm sure anything can happen, but I can tell you the laws are written in such a way that there should not be any way to get into the machines. They're tested before, they're tested after. Republicans and Democrats witnessed both of it. I don't know. I don't know what else you can do. And I do know that there are some people complaining, but if there's evidence, I know I've talked to Frank about this, Frank LaRose. He has said, if there is evidence, present the evidence and, and we will do whatever's necessary to fix those issues. But and I know he's trying, but again, it's, I, I don't know. When it comes to election integrity, everybody's going to complain, especially if their candidate loses. What do you think about voter ID? Well, I'm a big believer. I've always, when I ran for governor, I said, we need to have a voter ID. Everybody should have a voter ID. If you, if you can't afford one, the state should pay for it. If you're not a citizen, by the way, the federal law says, if you're not a citizen of this country, you don't vote. That's already a law. So all of this should be put into place and we should either have a voter ID or a qualified license that, that shows that you are a, you know, qualified to vote. Um, they do that in Indiana. In Indiana, they actually, pay, you got to, the state pays so that, at, because the argument is, well, there are some people can't afford the ID. They, some people can't afford the process. The state of Indiana actually pays for it. So you have that ID. I think that's one thing we should be uh, working towards here in Ohio as well. Uh, Jim, is the only reason that, and this is mostly Democrats, but I don't want to point at one side or the other, but is there a reason that the the excuse of, you know, African Americans can't get registered or can't can't get IDs as easily as other races. Is there ever going to be a time when we just say enough with this nonsense and stop pretending that that's a real thing? Cause it's not, it's I, I, in my opinion, it's not maybe, maybe I'm missing something, but it just seems like we're accepting any old nonsense to let the lie keep going. Well, I would agree with you. There's no reason that and anybody that wants a vote can vote. Anybody that needs a vote can apply. You can do it when you get your, your license. I mean, there's so many ways now to register to vote that I, I just don't agree with that anymore. But that's always going to be the argument. You know, one of the arguments that, that I'm trying to push for in Ohio is that we close the election. So Republic in primaries, Republicans vote for Republicans, Democrats vote for Democrats. First argument I heard was that's going to stop people from voting. Why? I mean, you're, reg you're registering today on the day of the primary, why not register in advance? You can do it on the computer. Well, then people say, well, they don't have computers. Okay, well, a friend has it. There's always a way to do it if you want to do it. Right. A, a library has a computer. There's plenty of ways to find <laughs> right. it. And on top of that, you, I mean, what, what's racist about needing an ID? You need an ID to get on a plane, uh, drive a car, go to a liquor store, buy cigarettes. You need an ID for all kinds of different things. I don't think it's too much to ask for an ID to vote. 100% agree. And I think we should make sure that people who vote have to show an ID, which I'm glad to see that we have voter ID in Ohio right now. Uh, I think that's important. I mean, as a Republican, I wish they didn't ask for an ID. I'd go in there five times during election day and ask for different ballots so I can get who I want voted in for once. But I like to also follow the law, which means you need to have an ID to vote. Absolutely. No, I agree with you. And like I said, that's just... That's just another excuse. I mean, if somebody wants to vote, it's it's a simple process, uh, and and it can, it's, can easily be done. 
Right. Jim, I, I want to go away from reasons not to vote to the actual run-up right now, because uh, there's this one, Seth and I have talked about this issue 15 different times in the last 15 weeks, and that is the just mudslinging up to straight-up lies in the advertising. I know last night I was watching the football game last night, and a Kamala ad came on that was just buried in this project 2025 which obviously president trump has said numerous times he has nothing to do with it's not his thing he's but but they're saying this is what president trump is going to do it's just not truthful it's not like it's a you know a misnomer or it could be interpreted one way or another the man has said i have nothing to do with this and they're still saying he does how can they get away with this and not not get at, at a minimum get the ad pulled for being absolutely false well one of the things i learned in politics and it's funny you're saying that because i had to laugh i saw an ad the other day where sherrod brown is saying that what bernie marino is saying about sherrod brown when it comes to chan transgenders is false right and by the way it probably is false because you know uh the state has already voted on that but in the end i have to laugh because when i ran against sherrod brown in 2018 Chair Brown actually ran an ad and, and the ads, you know, he didn't run ad, that the ad, every once in a while an ad sticks and the ad that stuck with me and some of your listeners might remember it was that Jim Renee is flying around in a corporate jet with a strip club owner and they had it on TV. It was absolutely false. Right. And I proved that it was false, but you know what the election commission said in Ohio? Hey, you're a public figure. Anybody can say anything. They can even lie about you. And my response was, well, what do I do? And then Sherrod Brown's lying about me. And they said, run a commercial saying that he's lying about you. Well, of course, I didn't have the funds to do that. Um, it looks like Sherrod Brown does because he's running the ad that says Bernie Marino's lying. So the question really comes down to, we really do need to change that. I don't care whether you're a public figure or not. We shouldn't, you should not be able to lie about somebody. Yeah. Now, for your listeners, I will tell you this. You can lie about anybody that's running because they're public fig figures. You can't liable anybody. And that's the difference. But saying that somebody is not pro-life or that somebody supports transgenders, that's all allowable in our state and pretty much in our country. Saying somebody, somebody is a child molester or whatever, that's liable. That's not allowed. But okay, but I've, I'm going to devil's advocate this for a minute, and I'm going to go specifically to Sherrod Brown and Bernie Marino because if you believe the ads that are running, they both should be in jail, not running for anything. They're, you know, it's Bernie Marino rips off his people, and Bernie Marino didn't pay his employees, and Sherrod Brown he wants transgender guys to be on the swim team, and you know, it's it's nonstop with these accusations that to me seem slanderous if they're not true at what point do we say at what point can we not get look i don't want to push more government on anybody but in this one instance i would love to see them just change it to you can run on your accomplishments but you can't run sandbag and the other guy and have better accomplishments and you'll get ahead is there any way we could have that happen well you know how that happens when when negative ads don't work anymore. 78% of negative ads work. 78% wow. of people vote based on negative ads. That's the problem. So I always tell the story. It's comical. I was at the Giant Eagle in Wadsworth. I had a woman come up to me and say, you look familiar. Oh, I remember you. You were the one who was flying around with the strip club <laughs> owner. That's why I didn't vote for you. And it was like, wow, ma'am, that just was not true. But that's okay. Everybody's vote is is allowed and you could you could vote any way you want but you see it was a negative ad it worked and that's the problem negative ads do work and the other thing that i proposed to bob the other day, i want these people to put their names on these ads if you're going to yeah. be an actor or you're going to be somebody that comes out in support of sherrod brown i want to see your name at the bottom of the screen i want you to actually come out and say this is who i am first last name and i'm voting for sherrod brown because of this because then i can call you out on your lies at least then I can at least call you out and say, I don't believe you and, and get some kind of response. 
if you're going to put your name on something, make sure you put your name on something. And they do make the make the person running the ad put their name on it. So why shouldn't we, especially, and, and I know what Seth is saying, especially these guys that are running the ads where I voted Democrat for the last 40 years, but this time I'm voting Republican because I believe blah, 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 whatever. You know, and, and there's a bunch of those ads that are running. But who is this guy? It's, you know. Jim from Bay Village, whoever that might be, you know, an <laughs> actor, getting, yeah. someone getting paid to come out and give an opinion. Exactly. Well, it's funny to say that because there is an ad. The guy's uh, like he's like he's sitting on his truck. He's a farmer, and he says, "I've been a Republican. I voted. Uh, I voted in 2016 for Donald Trump. I'm a solid Republican. I voted from 2020, but I'm not voting from in 2024." And I would agree with you. I like to know who that guy is. Yes, uh, but. You know, that's part of the First Amendment right. I'm telling you, this all gets down to First Amendment rights and and allowing people to say anything in regards to a public official. To fix that, to fix that, we have to have reforms, federal reforms that say, if you lie and it's proven you've lied, you're liable. And that would fix it. And, I'm, no. and I wish we could do that. Um, it, it, it would make these ads be a lot different. Now, one of the big things that oh, – go ahead, Chris, if you got something on Yeah, this. I do. Just real quick, a follow-up on that. If we were to get something like that on the floor or into law passed, would part of it be that if you are caught, that would, that would also in, you know, deactivate your election if you were the winner? Like take them out of office because they won on false pretense. Wow. That, you know what? I'm all for that, but um, I don't think that would pass because you got to remember some of these people get elected. <laughs> I hate to say this, but if you're talking, they may all say, I don't like to run negative ads, but if you notice, they all run negative ads, right? which means everybody, and they're the ones who would vote for that legislation. So in most cases, they're the ones that would say, well, that's probably pushing a little too far. Sure. I think we should just get it to the point if you are lying, you're liable and put a penalty on it, you know, a right. million dollars. I mean, it'll change. You put a number on it. That's very uncomfortable. It'll but even, even a million what, dollars today, Jim, I mean, we're talking billions of dollars being thrown around in this election. You know, Kamala Harris is paying $2 million to have Lizzo come and speak. I mean, a million dollar fine. If they win the election, is that really that much of a penalty? That's like me finding you a, a lunch at McDonald's. Well, as long as it's a million dollar personal. So if it goes after you personally, that's the key. And it can be impugned on your personal, your, your personal side. It would make people be a little bit different right now. And by the way, a lot of these negative ads are not done by the candidate. They're done by outside money. And that's also right. a First Amendment right. So it's hard because then you say, OK, you're going to you're going to find them a million dollars. Well, most of those entities go out of business after the election's over, which is one of the problems. Right. But there has to be a way of saying, okay, this entity was run by, and you can get to the bottom of it, you could subpoena, and whoever authorized the ad is then liable. <coughs> that would change things. Right. Uh, well, let me ask one more, Seth, real quick, before you change topics here. Um, yeah. I, and, and this might just be a common sense thing. And, and I'm just curious, and you have worked in Washington, obviously. Do politicians, everybody knows that we, we, the people that are being subjected to these ads, really get to where we absolutely dislike to the level of hate these politicians. We just, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I can't stand the sight of Bernie Marino or Sherrod Brown these days, just because every two seconds I get bombed with, with commercials. If I try to watch TV, is there any sense of caring about that? Because, and, and, and let me explain this because I want to make sure I get the right answer here or your, your honest answer. We see it in the elections. They hate each other. They hate each other. They're, they're wildly different. And then when the election's over, they congratulate each other and shake hands and talk about what a well-run campaign it was. We, the American people, do not react that way. We develop the hatred from watching these ads. And then once the election is over, we still have that hatred, which I honestly believe is detrimental to moving things forward once the election is over and we get to 
dealing with policy and getting, you know, getting people on board to support policy. Cause we come into it by the time they start governing, we come into it already really, really angry at a lot of these guys. And I think it's a detriment in the biggest picture to governing a state or on the federal level. Do, do politicians understand that or do they not care? Well, look, the, the purpose of a politician is to get reelected. So I, I think in the end, they really don't care. They may come on the show and tell you they do care. I mean, one of the reasons why I've got out of Washington is everything we're talking about. I mean, the lies, the perceptions, the, the um, I always remember when, when La Tourette, former Congressman La Tourette, I was just in Washington. I put this in my book. He called me to his office. I was only there a couple of weeks. And he says, he says, can you accept lies and deceptions? And I go, what kind of a question is that? And he said, I'm asking you a, a question you got, I want you to answer. And I go, absolutely not. He goes, you won't survive here. He goes, because this place was all about lies and deception. Ugh. He said, you'll have your best friend lie or deceive you just to get further ahead of you. And you know what? I saw that happen multiple times while I was in Washington. It's part of the problem because too many people want to be there. I really wanted to be there to serve. And then I realized when you, your service wasn't getting anything accomplished, it was time for me to leave. But there's too many people that are just locked into being there and they'll tell you one thing, but they don't, they, they just worry about being reelected. The number one goal, get reelected. Uh, speaking of lies and outside money and everything else, and I know we have to hit on it a little bit. Issue one is extraordinarily confusing to a lot of people. I think uh, the ballot language is pretty straightforward and clear though. Uh, but both sides are saying it stops gerrymandering <laughs> and, you see signs, I saw the other day a Trump sign in the yard along with a vote yes on issue one. I think people are confused. I think people don't know what to do. People don't understand that 90% of the money coming in on the yes side of issue one is outside of the state of Ohio. And issue one is very bad for this state. True or not? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I've been doing, two things I've been doing for the last few months, I've been traveling the state talking about issue one and our Supreme Court racers. We have to make sure that conservatives are elected to the Supreme Court. But when it comes to issue one, here's what I tell everybody. I just make it very simple. Because I, I was just in a group last week. I said, how many of you like uh, bureaucracies in our government? Nobody put up their hand. I said, how many of you like paid bureaucracies in our government? Nobody put up their hand. I said, how many? I'm going to add one more thing. How many of you like unaccountable paid bureaucracies. Um, nobody put up their hand. I said, how many of you would say that you do not want a paid unaccountable bureaucracy in your country, in your state, in your city? They all put up their hand. I said, there, it's pretty easy. You've just decided what you should do on issue one. You should vote no, because issue one authorizes a uh, you're a new bureaucracy in the state of Ohio that's paid, that's unaccountable to no one. And then it'll mm. go, well, and I'll tell you the arguments because I heard them all that day. Yeah. This, was a, this was a senior citizens group. They said, well, we don't like what's going on now. I go, well, neither do I. But if you want to fix it, make sure that it's accountable and make sure that we're not setting them another bureaucracy. So I said, look, even Governor DeWine has come out and said, he thinks we need to change the system, but this isn't the right system. And I said, there's not a lot of things that I agree with with Governor DeWine, but there's one. Yeah. Um, we should not be adding another bureaucracy. So for your listeners, that's how simple it is. I don't care that there's five Republicans and five Democrats and five independents. And by the way, none of those 15 people can have, have ever worked for an elected official, been an elected official. I mean, would you ever hire somebody off the street to decide how to to plumb your house or to no, you would want to find somebody who has some expertise in it. And yet we're going to find 15 people who are supposed to be non-political, never worked for anybody, and they're going to come up with a system. I tell you, in the end, you know who's going to come up with a system? A computer and a consultant. Those 15 people are going to hire a consultant and they're going to get a computer and they're going to draw the districts. 
why don't we just come up with a computer and a, a consultant, have the legislator design, legislature design the process, and then let the system draw it, and that's it. That'd be the simplest thing. People just got to vote no on, on this. It's not a fix. Because if you read the actual ballot language, it talks about this, quote, citizen group. And, you know, when people hear citizens, not politicians, everybody gets excited because most people have a poor view of politicians. But it's a group that they make their own salary. They can't be voted out. They they don't even, if you read, I think it's point number eight or nine or something on, in this ballot language, you can't even go to them with an opinion and tell them that you think that they're doing something wrong because that's against the bill. I mean, it's a dangerous thing that they're doing here. Well, here's what's even funny. When I was in this room, they said, listen, it's citizens over politicians. I said, okay, hold on a second. I said, what is a politician before they ever get elected to their first <laughs> office? And they said, a citizen. I said, right. But you don't like them once they're elected. 78% of people do not like politicians, elected officials. So we're going we're gonna to put, but at least you can vote them out if you don't like them. I said, in this case, you think the citizen is better than a politician, yet you have no authority to vote them out. It's just a bad situation. It really is. And I think if it's explained properly, this vote goes down. The problem is, you've already said it, there are so many people that are confused about it. They think it's, it's issue one is, you know, remember back in August of last year, vote yes on issue one, November, vote no on issue one, now vote yes. They're confused. They don't understand it. And then they see that commercial. We're all citizens and we believe citizens know better than politicians. Bingo. That is the greatest framing that the proponents of issue one could have ever done. And they did the same thing here in the city of Cleveland with the citizen review board on, on police. They, I don't know where these people think that this is going to help. It's just not. This is going to be horrible for the state of Ohio. Yeah, hundred percent agree. And I think, uh, you know, the citizens over politician framing was brilliant um, and we didn't counteract it. Now, I'll tell you what we could have done. And here's where I blame our legislature and our governor. The governor should have called a special session and, he sh and the legislature should have put a competing ballot in place. The reason for that is when I talk to people that say, OK, I agree with you, Renacy. I don't really like this, but our alternative is leave it the same and we don't like that. We lost those voters. We should have had a competing ballot. We don't. That I blame uh, our legislature and our governor because our governor was almost going to call a special session and then he didn't do it. And our legislature could have called a special session on their own. They didn't either. They let this go. Um, they're to be blamed as well when it comes down to not having a competing issue. And, and Tom texted in. I mean, he said that you know everything that we've discussed is going to be in the state constitution. This isn't something you could just get rid of tomorrow. I mean, this is like going to be there. You know what? Hundred percent agree. And that's the other problem. You got to do another. <laughs> you got to do another initiative to remove it. Right. Oh, I mean, yeah. otherwise you're just stuck with it. By the way, people also forget. The legislature used to do the drawn of the districts, and then we didn't like that. So we changed the law, and we said we're going to put a seven-member commission in. You know, the, the, the governor, the auditor, the secretary of state, the, the majority party and the minority party, one person from the House, one person from the Senate, and that was going to change things. And this is what I was telling people. Now we don't like that, but we want to change it again. What are we going to just keep changing it? Why don't we do it right? Let's figure out a way to do it right, and then let's change it and make it the right way. Sure. Jim, What um, outside of issue one and obviously the uh, presidential race, what are the other important, important things to be looking at on November 5th? Well, the one thing I think is important, especially in Ohio, is our Supreme Court races. You know, we go in there. We used to, back in the 90s when I was 100% into business, I was seeing the courts basically legislating from the bench. And at that time, there was a five to two uh, majority of Democrats on the Supreme Court. And everything they did was overturning laws and, and making decisions that where they were basically legislating. So what we did as business people is we worked very hard to change that. And we ended up with a Supreme Court that was 
uh, supermajority Republicans, and at one point in time, even seven Republicans. The problem is we quit paying attention. And in 2018, we lost two Republicans on the Supreme Court. In 2020, we lost another Republican on the Supreme Court. Now we're at four Republicans, three Democrats. And in the end, this will become one of the, there are two things that are more important. I think they're the most important races in the state of Ohio right now. Issue one, voting no. And on our Supreme Court races, voting for the candidates who are most conservative. And, pe and people really don't know the names, but it's Hawkins, Shanahan, and Dieters. Those are the three Republicans that people should be zeroing in on and making sure we're voting for. Because we do not want the face of the Supreme Court to change again, where the Supreme Court legislates from the bench. How do you think Bernie Moreno is going to fare on, on Tuesday? I think Bernie is closing the gap. I think he's moving in the right direction. Sherrod Brown is a tough opponent. Sherrod Brown's had a lot of money. This is a Trump state. Um, if if uh, Donald Trump wins by more than eight, I think Bernie uh, is our next senator. If uh, Donald Trump loses or wins by less than eight, I think uh, it'll be it'll be difficult. It just depends on where. I mean, if if Donald Trump only wins by two or three, which I don't think is going to happen, it'll be tough for Bernie to win. If Donald Trump wins by six, seven, or eight, Bernie's got a shot. And if and if Donald Trump wins by more than eight, Bernie will win. So uh, that's where we're going to be. There are a lot of voters that are going to vote for Donald Trump, a lot of Democrat voters, and they're not going to vote for Bernie Marino. I can tell you, I have experienced that in 2018. Um, they will cross over for Donald Trump, but every other every other name on that ballot will be DD. You know, it'll be a Democrat. So uh, let's hope for the best. And and uh, but right now he's moving in the right direction. I think everything's going in his favor. So we'll see. Hopefully he can pull it off. Do you think uh, Kucinich has a shot against Max Miller? I I don't. You know, look, and I hate to. Say, Max Miller is a friend of mine. I support Max Miller. Um, Dennis Kucinich is a friend of mine as well. I just don't think he can defeat Max Miller. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people say, how would you ever become friends with Dennis Kucinich? Well, <laughs> you know, back in, in Washington, Dennis was actually um, a Trump proponent. When I say not, pre not, not the name Trump, but some of the policies of Trump, Dennis yeah. was very supportive of. So, you know, he and I got along on some issues. There were some we totally disagreed on. But we, we uh, garnished a friendship from traveling back and forth on the airplane and, and being in Washington, D.C. So I would call him a friend, but I don't think I don't think he can defeat uh, Max Miller. I will say he's a good man. I talked to him. He actually called me when I was in the hospital when I was sick. And um, he, he's a good man. I don't necessarily agree with everything that he says, but I think he's a good person. It's, it's hard to defeat an incumbent. That. Look, it's yeah, yeah it I is. mean, it's 97 percent of the time incumbents win. So just very difficult. When I ran against um, Sherrod Brown and when I ran against even Governor DeWine, both people said, you're running against incumbents. And I said, I know, but I'm running for principles and, and, and trying to change things. But it's very difficult to, to defeat an incumbent. Sure. Jim, do you worry at all what's going to happen no matter which side wins on, you know, wins the presidential election? Do you worry about that next day and that next week being a a very rough, potentially bloody time in the streets with people. Cause it just seems like that's the collision course we're on no matter who wins. Well, look, I think Donald Trump has already said he's going to accept the results of the election. Uh, Kamala Harris has said the same thing. I hope they stick to their words. I think we need to have an orderly transition of power, no matter what. I'm hoping that we don't see that riding on the streets. I'm hoping we don't see any of that. I'll tell you what I'm more concerned about is the Republican Party. Um, I, you know, as a, as a diehard Republican, I do feel we have a separation in the Republican Party between Trump supporters, non-Trump supporters. And I'm, I'm really worried after November 5th, what happens to those two sides? Do they come together if Trump wins? Uh, do they come together if Trump loses? That is concerning for me because you know, the party has to stay together no matter what happens. 
But don't you think that they will come together because the next guy will not be Donald Trump? Well, I hope, but you got to remember, there are some people that believe the real staunch right MAGA people will say the hell with it. The election was stolen. I'm never going to vote again. That's the concern I okay. have. And then, you know, we got to bring them back. All of these people should be part of the decision making process, whether Donald Trump wins or loses in the future of our party. We got to make sure everybody comes back. I could have swore Jamie Raskin said he was not going to accept the uh, results if or certify that election if, if, if Trump wins. I think there could be some issues if if uh, if Trump does win this election. Well, I think there's always going to be people to say that. People somewhat forget in 2016, and I was I was in the House of Representatives at that time. People would you can go back and watch this. At the gavel was Vice President uh, at that time, Vice President Biden. The Democrats were complaining that the election was stolen. The results are incorrect. We can't move forward. I'll never forget Biden putting the gavel up, pointing it at him and say, the election is over, Donald Trump is president, and he slammed the gavel down. And that ended it. I hope that no matter what happens, we move forward after this election and really, really come together as a country, because that's what we really need, uh, Democrats and Republicans, but Republicans, MAGA Republicans, non-MAGA Republicans, we got to work together and move our country forward. All right, so I was I was corrected here. A Bob France episode of the uh, the War Room will be on Thursday night, at seven p.m. on Facebook and YouTube. Tell us about the Buckeye War Room. Well, I appreciate that. Look, the Buckeye War Room is all about the state of Ohio, but it also is about national issues. We just did a a podcast um, regarding the national debt, for instance. Brought in Maya McGinnis from Washington D.C. to talk about it. Hopefully, your listeners can can. Uh, have the opportunity to look at that, see that's one of the issues we forget about, national debt. You know, if you look at both candidates, Harris or Trump, neither of them are addressing the national debt. In fact, both of them are going to raise the national debt. That's a problem. When I ran for Congress, the national debt was under $10 trillion. Today, it's at $32 trillion. Nobody's talking about it. We brought that up in the Buckeye War Room. We had uh, Frank LaRose talk about uh, ballot issues. Uh, you know, issue one. So we're trying to bring issues to Ohioans that are about Ohio elections, Ohio policy, uh, and Ohio government, but also national government as well, national issues. Jim, so the, how, do, how do we stand on national debt as a state versus the national debt, or versus the national debt? How do we, I mean, are we on par with the, with the are we 150th of it, or are we better, or are we worse as a state? Well, the state of Ohio, you're required to balance the budget, so, okay. so we don't. But here's the problem with the state of Ohio is that a big chunk of the, the money that comes in to help balance our budget is federal dollars. So as long as we're going to take, and, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe we're probably creeping up close to you know, 40%, if not 50%, of dollars that come in just to help us balance our budget. Now, think about that. If you need 40% of the money coming in to balance your residential budget, your home budget, your business budget, that's a serious problem if they're also printing money. So, uh, you know, what the federal government spends way too much money. State of Ohio spends way too much money as well, but it balances it out by getting federal dollars. Uh, you know, our state budget is almost the same as the state of Florida's budget, yet Florida has twice the population. That should tell you that Ohio really needs to look at its spending and bring the, that spending down. And what, so, what is what is the cause of that? Do we know? I mean, is it the loss of industry or is it, I mean, what is it? That's, that's no, we've, we, uh, look, uh, we spend way too much on the Medicaid system. You know, we, we, we did um, open up the Medicaid system during the Obama years. Uh, and and Medicaid, the Medicaid system now takes up a big chunk of our budget. That might be the 50% number now that I think about it. Medicaid is a big number, uh, and it's just growing. It's growing at such a pace that it also is moving very quickly 
in our state budget. So until we address Medicaid, remember in, in the state budget, you really only have four issues. You got Medicaid spending, you got prisons, you got roads and bridges, and you got education. That's it. Um, and we spend way too much money in, Medi in the Medicaid system right now. You know, our roads and bridges were funded by the Kasich Turnpike uh, cell, but all that money is gone now. So we got to spend money on our roads and bridges. Uh, you know, that was a one-time shot in the arm that should have never been done. Uh, and again, our school systems, we need to look at those. You know, you don't want to, if you start talking about our school systems and think about, you know, all the overhead we had, well, over all the overhead we have, some of these school systems are going to have to, you know, um, consolidate. We're just spending too much money for the population. That's really the issue. Governor Kasich had my uh, eyes closed there for a while. I thought he was a great guy and a great Republican and uh, had me fooled. He used to stand outside smoking a cigarette, talking to him. He told me to cut my hair. And I thought he was the best guy for the state of Ohio. And then I realized not so much. Not well, he, well he did two things. He expanded Medicaid. That yeah. was under Kasich. Yep. And he sold the turnpike for a one-time shot in the arm of dollars, which we now don't have. And by the way, we now don't have the revenue from the turnpike either. Oof. So real quick, what's next for you? Any political aspirations on the horizon, Governor? You know has a, a nice ring to it. Yeah, I'm going to wait until after November 5th. I, I'm really, I, I've told everybody, we really need to see where we settle in after November 5th. Not that I believe there's going to be the riots that you were talking about, but I do believe there's going to be some storm after November 5th as to who wins, what direction the country's taken, do Republicans come together, all of this stuff. And I really think after that's, the decision should be made. But I will tell you, there are some people running right now that I don't think are going to change anything. And I think Ohioans deserve better. So we'll see what happens after November. Appreciate that. Well, Mr. Renee said, thank you for coming on today. Check out the Buckeye War Room on Facebook, YouTube. Again, Thursday night, 7 o'clock, uh, Bob France will be on. So looking forward to checking that one out. Uh, but uh, we really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. And for anybody who wants to learn more about what I'm doing, jimrenacci.com, J-I-M-R-E-N-A-C-C-I.com. You can follow up with the Buckeye War Room and some of these other issues as well. Great, jimrenacci.com. Well, Jim, we will have to get a hold of you after the election to see what, what your reaction is to all that's going to happen. See if we're doomed. <laughs> if well, we're, we're not going to be doomed. I will tell all your listeners, we have a great country. Um, we're going to get the Senate. We're going to have a divided government potentially, but no matter what, this government can withstand a lot of things. And especially if we're divided, if we are divided, we can get, we're not going to get a lot of these things accomplished that some people are worried about. So our country will withstand. Well, if the power grid is still working, we will talk to you then. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Talk to you, Jim. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. So you. Bye now. Jim Renese, fantastic guy. I love talking to him, and I really appreciate him taking the time all the time, like an hour, talking to us. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, so that's very cool. I, mean, I couldn't be more thankful to him and Tom yeah. for. And we got a lot of good. We got a lot of good information out there. I thought so. I learned a bunch. Yeah, two dopey guys sitting here talking <laughs> politics. I'm, well, that's that's who votes. Dopey guys, is. dopey guys, dopey girls. That's Look, who's voting. We, we are the the. Uh, the p political block, man. That's what, you know, that's who they're trying to get the votes from the people like us. That's right. And I think, uh, you know, Jim is a good guy and a good, uh, he knows a lot. So check out the Buckeye War Room and Bob France will be on there Thursday night, seven o'clock. Should be fun. Right on. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening today. I think we have time to wrap things up again. Uh, three years to the day since Trib passed away and my heart goes out to his friends, his family, um, and his listeners, you know, everybody Absolutely. that listened to his show was was a giant family, and I was lucky to be part of that family for almost fifteen years. That's right. So I uh, I really do uh, appreciate that, and I appreciate the the Triv fans letting me be a part of it. So yep, very good. All right, right, right I guess now that's back that. to chicken wing <laughs> talk. No, Tom, <laughs> I'm not talking chicken wings. Although we could. Although, we could. We could talk about chicken wings all day long, believe me. And how they're too expensive. 
Yeah, look, two fat guys. You think we don't know a thing or two about chicken wings? I know a hell of a lot more about chicken wings sometimes than I do about anything else. And, Tom, I know you have some chicken at your house that look awfully tasty. That's right. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Tom, for, for your uh, help with that, that interview as well. Everybody have a great rest of your night. God willing, we'll talk to you on Wednesday, and then we'll have extra content on Minds on Wednesday. If you like what you hear during the regular show, you're really going to like what you hear after the regular show on Wednesdays. Yeah. It's this, so, but dirty. <laughs> yeah, it's a little dirty, but spend five bucks. And it'll get you through a month of extra stuff. and Or hell, spend 50. It'll get you a year of it. Yeah, that's right. We're still waiting for that guy. We're still waiting year. for that guy. <laughs> but, well, you know, hey, we haven't been the most reliable at times. Let's just that be honest. true. But we're going that way. We're headed yeah. in that direction. We've been doing it religiously. Mm-hmm. So um, check it out, minds.com for the extra content on uh, Wednesdays. But everybody else, have a great rest of your night and a great week. And we will talk to you then. Sound good? Sounds good. All right, my friends. All right. See, you. See ya. Seth Williams loves this last dance tall and proud. Believes in freedom, speaks his mind out loud. Mentored by Trip, he learned to be tough. Life knocked him down, but he got back up. Lake, but he's still strong and true Chasing dreams under skies of red, white, and blue Voting for Trump, he shouts it clear WTAM tried to bring him down, but he's still here In the heart of America, Seth takes a stand Against the tides, he defends our land Liberals call him crazy, but he don't care He's got the spirit of an eagle soaring high in the air. Hates LeBron James, won't wear that crown. Prefers hard work and blue jeans in this town. Radio waves try to shut him up, but Seth keeps singing, filling that cup. From the small town streets to the mountain high. Seth sees the flag waving, reaching for the sky. He keeps on fighting with a rebel yell for every fallen soldier and the stories they tell. In the heart of America, Seth takes a stand against the tides. He defends our land. Liberals call him crazy, but he don't care. He's got the spirit of an eagle soaring high in the air. On the small town streets to the mountain high, Seth sees the flag waving, reaching for the sky. He keeps on fighting with a rebel yell for every fallen soldier and the stories they tell. In the heart of America, Seth takes a stand Against the tides, he defends our land Liberals call him crazy, but he don't care He's got the spirit of an eagle, soaring high in the air Looking to sell your car quickly and for top dollar? At BuyYourCars.net, we make it easy. Whether your vehicle is new, used, or even damaged, we'll buy it in any condition. Fast offers, quick cash, and hassle-free transactions. What more could you ask for? Just visit BuyYourCars.net, enter your vehicle information, and get a fast offer within minutes. Ready to sell? Call us today at 770-815-0342 or fill out the contact form at buyyourcars.net. Get cash fast for your car the easy way. 
buyyourcars.net. Selling your car has never been easier.